Thanks to all of you who are joining us here in person and those who are joining us uh, online all over the place. My name is Jim Wallace, and I'm chair of the Faith and Justice Center here at Georgetown. And we are co-sponsoring this with the Women's Center here at Georgetown. I want to thank in particular Dr. Annie Selleck, who is, there she is, uh, director of the Women's Center for her role in Central making all this happen. So it's great to be, be together and do this tonight with such a wonderful guest, which I'm going to introduce. So as you know, uh, March 1st is the Black Women's Appreciation Day, a day that lies at the intersection of Black History and Women's History Month. As a part of our mission at the center to build a multiracial democracy and advance a deeper integration of religious values and society and civic life, the Center on Faith and Justice is honored to mark March 1st this year by hosting the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas. Um, she serves as the canon theologian at Washington National Cathedral and theologian in residence at Trinity Church Wall Street. Uh, it's a very long uh, bio, I won't go through it all, but let me just highlight a couple of things. I've known her for such a long time. Her academic work as a dean is focused on womanist theology. Um, black theology, sexuality in the black church, racial and social justice, in addition to preaching pulpits all across the nation, all around the world, she is a vocal presence in today's media, all kinds, print, broadcast, digital, and she's, uh, we were talking before, she, her words land in all kinds of places. Uh, I think she's really a pioneer and an early architect of womanist theology. She has laid the structure and the foundation and many other voices have risen up, but she's one of the first voices to really speak of what womanist theology is, which is a perfect uh, guest for us to have tonight. Kelly is the author of numerous articles, op-eds, books. Her most recent book, Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter. Her other books include The Groundbreaking and Widely Taught Sexuality in the Black Church, which we just talked about back in the room, and a, a womanist perspective. Stand your ground, black bodies and the justice of God. And the Black Christ, in December 2022, she was uh, at University of Louisville and Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary announced our guest tonight as the 2023 winner of the Grammeyer Award for Resurrection Hope a future where Black Lives Matter. This is probably the most significant award in the field of religion. And of course, she won the award. At the time of her ordination, uh, Kelly Brown Douglas was one of the first 10 black women ordained in the Episcopal Church. She holds a master's degree in theology and a PhD in systemic theology from Union Theological Seminary. A personal note, I always make my students read her theology of Re reparations. And Kelly Brown Douglas is literally one of my favorite people on the planet. Help me w welcome our friend, Kelly Brown Douglas. Thank you, and thank you to my friend and colleague and my brother, Dr. Jim Wallace, I say when he calls, I don't even look at my calendar. I know that I'm going to figure out a way to answer the call. And I thank you for not simply that gracious introduction, but not only for your friendship, but most importantly, for your work and your witness. And because of your work and your witness, the path was paved just a little wider 
for folk like me, so thank you. Thank you all for having me here on this evening, the Faith and Justice Center, and what a pleasure to meet Reverend uh, Ebony, and oh my goodness, Dr. and Sulek, thank you for inviting me here and the Women's Center and for the work uh, that you are doing. And uh, your new person here for a week, it's, you all are doing great work here at Georgetown, and so it is such a pleasure uh, and an honor to be here. So let me begin. I come to you this evening through, as uh, Dr. Wallace said, through the lens of a womanist theological scholar. That is, as one committed to the survival and wholeness of entire people, and thus I come with a decided urgency to make a difference in this our time when so many people are treated as other than the sacred creations of God that they are. This is an urgency to pay my rent for living on this earth, which means at least getting on the ark that bends toward God's justice. It is the urgency to make a just difference in the lives of black children and other children of color who are disproportionately trapped in conditions which threaten their lives and dishonor their dreams. For me, such an urgency is an imperative of not simply what it means to be womanist, but of what it means to be human. This is the urgency to make real the dreams of black parents, especially black mothers, to protect the lives and indeed the dreams of their children. And so it is that as a womanist who is a mother, I come with the urgency of a dream, a dream handed down to me by my mother. Hers was a dream that seemed for her to be on its way to becoming reality one hot Wednesday afternoon in August. I remember that day like it was yesterday. My brother, two sisters, and I were playing in our bedrooms while my parents were sitting on the living room couch watching something on TV. Out of nowhere, with a sense of urgency, my mother called the four of us to come quickly to see what they were watching. We all ran in, not quite knowing what to expect. When we got there, she told us to sit down and watch because, she said, history was being made. I didn't know what she meant by that, but, of course, I followed her instructions. I sat down and I watched the history that was being made on the television screen. I remember watching and wondering why so many people, especially black people, were all standing in the hot sun listening to a man give a speech. My then six-year-old mind was not taking in what he was saying. What I was taking in, however, was my mother's reactions to his words. She was clearly moved. Occasionally, she would utter, that's right. That history-making day was, of course, August 28, 1963, when 34 years old Martin Luther King Jr. seized the American imagination with his anti-racist dream for this nation, for its people, for its children. What I did not realize then was that my, the, the history being made in that moment in time for my mother was about her dream the dream she had for her children. For she believed that on that day, it was coming just a little bit closer to reality. She too wanted her four children to live in an anti-racist world where they, as King said, will not be judged for the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. She too wanted, as King dreamed, a time when, as he said, little black children will be able to join hands with little white children as siblings. 53 years later, there was another history-making day in this country. It, too, was on a hot Wednesday, 
On that night, hundreds if not thousands watched a live stream Facebook video of a black man dying after a police stop turned fatal. This time I was the mother calling my then 23-year-old son's attention to what I was seeing on the video screen. Just saw the video of police killing yet another black man. As always, be careful, stay safe, and remember what to do if you are stopped by whatever reason, by, for whatever reason by the police. Hands on steering wheel, do nothing, stay nothing, stay alive. This was the text I sent my son. Oh yeah, my son texted back. It didn't help Philandro, so now what are we supposed to do? That July 6, 2016 night reflected the historical realities of being black and male in America. Black males like 32-year-old Philandro Castile are two and a half times more likely to be killed by the police than their white counterparts. 57 years after my mother called our attention to her dream being played out on the television screen, another mother's dream for a world where her child could grow up judged not by the color of his skin was foiled. It was a hot Monday in Baltimore. On that day, a nine-year-old black boy was turned away from entering a restaurant. The white restaurant manager said the outfit that the nine-year-old black child was wearing violated dress code. Yet, as the boy's mother pointed out, a little white boy was permitted to eat in the restaurant wearing an outfit remarkably similar to the one her black son was wearing. As the mother later remarked, and I quote her, I have faced racism time and time again, but it's hard when you have to see your child upset because he knows he's being treated different than a white child, end quote. How are the Black Lives Matter protests really making a difference? This was the text I received from my son after he watched a video which the little boy's mother posted of that June 24th, 2020 incident. In that moment, I felt the deep despair of the dream that I had for my son being dashed. Today, 60 years after King shared his dream on that hot August day, giving voice to many a black mother's dream, indeed many a black parent's dreams for their children, recent studies tell us that black boys are perceived as threatening as early as five years old by white people. Similarly, black girls in the age range of 5 to 14 are perceived as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers. These perceptions of black boys and girls undoubtedly contribute to the fact that black students are almost four times as likely to be suspended from school as white students, almost three times as likely to be removed from the classroom but kept within school, and almost three times as likely to be expelled. Moreover, black children are almost two and a half times more likely to be arrested than white children. Black youth are nine times more likely than white youth to receive an adult prison sentence. And while black youth make up approximately only 15% of all youth in the United States, they constitute 41% of juveniles in the population committed to residential placement. Just four years after King proclaimed his dream to the nation, he pronounced in a May 8, 1967 interview with NBC correspondent Sander Van Oker that his dream, he said, it turned into a nightmare. Indeed, my friends, for so many black mothers today, the dreams for our children have become a nightmare that threatens their lives and well-being every single day. How are we to explain this? How are we to understand the seemingly unshakable prevalence of racial injustice in this nation that continues seemingly unabated as it imposes itself upon the lives of black children, of black youth, from the streets to the classrooms to college campuses, threatening their well-being, threatening their dreams? And even if we are to figure that out, 
that is to understand the reason for such intransigence when it comes to racial injustice in this country, what are we to do about it? What ought our responsibility be as educators, as learners, as institutions of higher learning? What is our responsibility at a place like Georgetown University as a community of learners? What is our responsibility to the dreams of mothers, to the dreams of our children, for a world where all will be treated as the sacred beings that they are? What's our responsibility? These are the questions that I will engage in for a moment this evening, not with the intention of providing definitive answers, but rather to simply provoke, I hope, a conversation that perhaps prompts new questions about who we are and who we can and should be, as well as the difference that we can make as individuals, as an institution, and as King might say, getting on the art that bends toward justice. And so, I want to begin by inviting you into perhaps what may be an uncomfortable space for some of seeking to understand the roots of this nation's seemingly inherent resistance to racial justice. How are we to understand the persistent resistance to racial justice in this nation? To understand this, and find a way beyond it means that we must first appreciate two race dynamics that are constitutive to our nation's fundamental identity, whiteness and anti-blackness. Now hear me, when I speak of the whiteness that shapes America's identity and is intrinsic to America's founding, I am not talking about a biological or an ethnic given. Rather, I am referring to a socially constructed demarcation of race that serves as a badge of privilege and power. Whiteness symbolizes and signals relationships and actualities of power. It defines the multi-nefarious relationality between those who represent the privileged dominant caste signaled by whiteness, and those who represent the marginalized subjugated caste signaled by blackness. Whiteness fuels white supremacy, which in turn exists to protect whiteness itself. For white supremacy is the network of systemic, structural, and ideological constructs that protects the presumed superiority of whiteness by, as you know, granting certain privileges to those raced white and not to others. These privileges are likewise social, political, economic, cultural, ideological, and even epistemological, to which I'll return. Now, it is important also to note that even as tenacious as the construct of whiteness is in America, it does not function alone. For whiteness as a construct exists only in opposition to that which is non-white. In this regard, it finds its most oppositional counterpart in blackness. The construct of whiteness, therefore, is inextricably linked to an anti-black narrative. This anti-black narrative has deep roots within Western thought and even within the Christian theological infrastructure. The narrative casts black people as inferior beings ruled by controllable sexualized passions with little or no rational capacity. Consequently, black people are perceived as little more than dangerous predatory beasts likely to erupt into violence at any time with little provocation. This anti-black narrative has seeped deeply into America's collective consciousness. It thus accounts for, even as it perpetuates, a deep-seated fear if not contempt for blackness itself within the American psyche. The fact that black children are perceived as dangerous and adult-like as early as five years of age is the result of an unrelenting anti-black narrative. And imagine, if a five-year-old is perceived as dangerous, what that means for a 15 or 25-year-old black person Hence, the reality of deadly policing and racialized microaggressions, micro only to those who aggress, which disrupt black lives every day. 
Now, it is with this appreciation, as you go with me deeper into these uncomfortable spaces, and thank you, it is with this appreciation of these dynamics of whiteness and anti-blackness that are intrinsic to America's foundation and identity, it is with this appreciation that we can begin to explain the apparent intransigence of racial injustice in this country and get us to what we can do about it. For both of these dynamics have severely compromised our nation's moral imaginary. The imaginary is different from the imagination. It is suggestive of more than an ideal or even a vision. The moral imaginary suggests our nation's moral impulse. It is the reflexive moral response that is the nation's almost instinctive reaction to social justice issues and concerns. Essentially, the moral imaginary is that palpable yet imperceptible force that defines the way in which a nation intuitively and sometimes unwittingly perceives and responds to matters of injustice as well as the way it envisions and enacts justice. The moral imaginary is conspicuously shaped by the group that has been historically, culturally, and socially dominant and privileged in the nation. In the words of 21st, 20th century social psychologist Eric Fromm, in any society, he says, the spirit, that which I call the imaginary, of the whole culture is determined by the spirit of those groups that are most powerful in that society. And in this instance, there is simply no getting around it. Our nation's moral imaginary has been shaped by whiteness. That is, by a white way of knowing. That's the epistemology. <laughs> by a white gaze. This gaze reflects the normative story through which to judge and evaluate information. It sets the standard of whose knowledge is acceptable for interpreting and evaluating reality. It is the gaze that controls the knowledge put forth on the public square. It is the privileged gaze through which all public knowledge, be it knowledge of the past or the present, is to be considered and appraised. It is the gaze that determines whose truth is to be accepted, whose truth is to be believed. Specifically, when it comes to the controlling gaze of our nation, any discomforting information when it comes to the preeminence of whiteness is filtered out or marginalized. Like the construct of whiteness itself, it serves to protect this privileged gaze, uh, that serves to protect this gauge, it is oppositional. Therefore, it cannot accommodate anything that would challenge an assessment of reality or of the American story as anything less than a white story. <laughs> Philosopher Charles Mills might describe it as a part of a white unknowing, wherein the white delusion, he says, of racial superiority insulates itself against refutation. Now, is the case with the construct of whiteness itself, this privileged gaze does not function in an ideological vacuum. It interacts with and reinforces the anti-black narrative, black knowing, even if it is an interpretation of a black experience or of black history, black knowing is discredited in advance as being suspect. The interface of the anti-black narrative with the privileged white gaze literally renders the notion of black knowing an, amoxim, uh, an oxymoron. Essentially, black people and those raced black, people of color in general, have no authority, that is, no epistemic authority when it comes to knowledge production, when it comes to truth. There's no better example of this than the attack on the New York Times 1619 project curated by Nicole Hannah-Jones, as well as the subsequent attacks on critical race theory. In fewer than a hundred pages, the 1619 Project dared to challenge the privileged gaze of whiteness and hence the dominating reality of white knowing. Moreover, it did so by placing blackness at the center of the nation's story. Thus, almost predictably, the 1619 Project and CRT has a 
has been attacked and caricatured as un-American, unpatriotic, and even treasonous. Perhaps needless to say, this privileged gaze has far-reaching impacts for the nation's social, political, and cultural realities, which routinely play out in policies, laws, in the political arena, on the public square, and even as it plays out in our everyday perceptions of reality. And it is here that we see the impact of this privileged gaze on our nation's moral imaginary. In setting the norm of authoritative knowing, this privileged white gaze invariably influences judgments concerning justice and injustice. It shapes the way in which justice is conceived, if not enacted. For just as it determines whose knowledge has authority, it also determines whose voice has moral efficacy. In keeping with the white, anti-black identity of the nation consistent with this gaze, black moral authority, as well as that of others not raced white, becomes virtually impossible. Now, my friends, the reality of this is not just academic or theoretical. It plays itself out in the real world, in real lives. I will never forget an incident that took place during my son's middle school years. A white female student accused him of verbally abusing her with language I had never heard my son use and doubted he knew. The white female director of the school immediately believed my son's accuser, despite the fact that my son had never been in trouble at the school, whereas the little girl had. Not even the testimony of two black teachers who witnessed part of the interaction could convince the director that the girl's accusations were false. I was called by one of the black teachers to come to the school immediately because my son was about to be unjustly suspended. It was not until the girl's mother, though she was not witness to the event at all, said that she believed my son was being truthful, did the director resent the suspension though, of course, without an apology to my son or consequences to the girl who had falsely accused him. Now, this incident was troubling on several levels, not the least of which was the fact that already implanted within the little girl's consciousness was a sense of a privileged gaze that provided her with moral authority, and so she instinctively knew that she could falsely accuse a little black boy and get away with it. Only another white person could invalidate her story. This incident was not unusual as other black parents have witnessed to several similar incidents. Incidents like this, as you know, also play itself out every day, even on college campuses where we regularly see the testimony of students of color doubted or needing verification by someone not raced black if they're ever to be taken seriously. Studies have also shown how this white gaze plays out on our public square. For instance, despite the video that went viral of George Floyd's, well, lynching at the knee of police, coupled with other similar videos, not to speak of black people's testimony that this fatal event reflected a pattern of racialized police brutality, a 2020 study showed that only 55% of the white public compared with 88% of black people believed the race was a factor. It similarly showed that only 49% of whites believed that police were more likely to use force against a black person than against a white person. Essentially, this study reveals that a privileged white gaze is so profound that it prevents those who have been impacted by it and from which it has not been interrupted from accepting the truth of black knowing, even when the truth is right before their eyes. It is in this way that a moral imaginary, grounded in a white gaze, informed by an anti-black narrative, cannot envision a view of society that eliminates racial injustice inasmuch as it fosters a white unknowing, as Mills would say, when it comes to matters of racial justice and injustice. In the final analysis, such a gaze has so corrupted our nation's moral imaginary that white privileging and black persecution have become almost reflexively synonymous 
with justice. And it is certainly the case that as long as this nation's moral imaginary is held captive to such a raced gaze, a mother's dream of a society where black children will not be judged by the color of their skin, not to speak of a future where black lives will matter, that dream will remain forever more fantasy than reality. And so, why is it that racial injustice is so intransigent in this country? In summary, because it has been stifled by a moral imaginary corrupted by a gaze defined by whiteness and formed by anti-blackness. And so, what does all of this have to do with us? What does it mean for our institutions of higher learning, like Georgetown, who in fact have committed themselves to a program of reparations, that is, committed to repairing the breach that an anti-black, white supremacist past has created in our present. What must those reparations look like? What repair must we do to help expand ours and our nation's moral imaginaries so to make racial justice really possible? Where can we begin at a place like this? There is no doubt that some form of reparation remedy is in order if racial justice is ever to be achieved in this nation, be they the remedy of funds, scholarships, or other programs to address the legacy of harm done to generations of black persons and persons of color. However, in an attempt to repair the harm that has been done, and thus to create a world where all persons have equitable life-enhancing choices, reparations must go beyond compensatory payments and remedies. Rather than simply looking back, reparations must also look forward. Reparations must address the gap between the nation's unjust present and the nation's vision of itself as a place where all persons have equal opportunities for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And our institutions must do likewise. In other words, reparations should also demonstratively chart a comprehensive path to a more just future within our nations and our communities, thus closing the gap between an unjust present and a more just future. If they don't do that, then they become little more than a salve for white guilt while we remain trapped in a white moral imaginary that allows the sin of anti-blackness and racial injustice to thrive. And so where do we begin? We began by holding ourselves accountable, borrowing from the words of Mahatma Gandhi, accountable to the change we want to see. Put another way, we have to be accountable to the kind of world we claim we want to live in, the kind of community we claim we want to be. We as institutions of higher learning are not to be gatekeepers of an unjust status quo. Rather, we are to provide a gateway to a more just future. Borrowing from the words of Peruvian Catholic theologian Gustavo Gutierrez, we are, as he says, to reflect upon a forward-directed action that penetrates the present reality, driving toward the future that is just. And so it is. The first step, I believe, to expanding the moral imaginary is holding ourselves accountable to the world we want to live in, accountable to the dreams of black mothers and perhaps to our own dreams of a new world where no person is judged by the color of their skin, by the country they come from, by the language they speak, by the pronouns they use, but rather respected and honored for their very sacred humanity. So how do we get there? What does this look like on the ground? What does it mean for Georgetown? What might that mean for the work done in the classroom and beyond? In appreciating the way in which the privileged white gaze with its notions of whiteness and anti-blackness compromises our moral imaginary, as, the, as well as the way it fosters 
It, it is fostered and sustained through our educational institutions on every level. Note the fierce battles within local school boards regarding CRT. The work of expanding our nation's moral imaginary must begin with interrogating what we teach, what we read, what has become normative curriculums within our various departments of study. This means, for example, that we must critically examine the work of the various scholars and thinkers we use to assess the ways in which their ideas, their methodologies, and paradigms have been shaped by and perpetuate a white gaze and notions of anti-blackness. You know, I am consistently struck by the ways in which the thought of thinkers like Kant, Locke, Hume, or even the works of Shakespeare, and the list can go on, how these things are taught and used as authoritative resources and are a part of our teaching and curriculum without mention of, not to speak of serious attention to, the ways in which they have fostered a white gaze and anti-black thinking, or the ways in which their philosophies and methodology provided the fertile foundation for the rise of scientific and religious racism. How in the world does one talk about Kant without recognizing that Kant is rightfully considered one of the founders of modern scientific racism and thus a pioneering theorist of subpersonhood sub and disrespect? Now, I am not suggesting, don't hear me say, that we don't teach these thinkers. Quite the contrary. Rather, I am saying that when we do teach them, we cannot ignore and leave uninterrogated those aspects of their work and thought. For doing so only deprives us of a means for understanding the subtly complex and insidious ways in which ant anti-black notions and white racism are fostered and sustained. It also eliminates the opportunity to appreciate the complicated ways in which race and racism function and manifest itself, thus stifling all of our ability to recognize, resist, if not eliminate it. Indeed, to leave, ignore, leave and ignore uninterrogated those aspects of our intellectual history and traditions is itself, my friends, an expression of a privileged white gaze as it essentially mystifies the very realities of race that have shaped our country's history. As such, it provides tacit legitimation for those who would argue that critical race theory has no foundation and is itself racist, injecting race where it is not present. To ignore the race parts of our intellectual history perpetuates a white unknowing, and we can't do that in an institution of higher learning. There is no getting around it. Essential to expanding our moral imaginary and thus becoming the nation, the people, and the institution that we claim we want to be is telling the truth, thus exposing the way in which our history has been shaped by, even as they have shaped anti-black racism and thus constructed a white gaze, that is, those who have become normative in our intellectual history. My friends, when I think of institutions of higher learning, such as Georgetown, one thing is clear to me. These are institutions which are presumably helping the next generation of thinkers, of leaders, to ask new questions, so to move the world forward toward being more just. Therefore, institutions such as these are compelled to change the story that is passed down from generation to generation, and perhaps even change the ways of thinking and knowing. The point of the matter is, as long as the story that is passed from one generation to another is the same old story defined by a white gaze, then it becomes virtually impossible to chart a new course for the future. From generation to generation, the moral imaginary will remain captive to the false narratives of history and thought that do not reflect the complex and complicated truth of who we are as a nation, as a society, as a people. And so it should be no surprise to us when incidents of vulgar racism and anti-blackness occur even on our college campuses. 
They will continue to occur as long as we do not interrupt the white unknowing that is so corrupted our moral imaginaries, making such vulgar racism and anti-blackness appear, well, acceptable and normal. Bottom line, if a place like Georgetown and other schools of higher learning is to be a part of expanding our nation's moral imaginary, then it must first intentionally interrogate the stories we tell, the knowledge we pass on not only in the classroom, but even in the very artifacts and fabric of the institution itself. However, I'm coming to the end, it must not stop there. Because to stop there would change nothing. If indeed we are to really expand the moral imaginary and dismantle, if you will, the white gaze, then we must literally change the gaze. To change the gaze means that we must, with intention, bring the knowledge, the voices, and experiences of those who have historically been granted little or no authority or moral efficacy, those who have been left out, those who have been marginalized, those who have been pushed to the side of our knowing. We must bring them to the center of our knowing. The subjugated knowledge must come to the top. So for instance, those perspectives of those marginalized persons must no longer be ignored or treated as the add-on within our teaching and our work or the electives within our curriculums. Rather, they must be seen as essential voices and as core required voices within our disciplines and within our curriculums. There are two assumptions that inform the necessity of such a centering. First, if we are really serious about creating a more just society, then we must get to the root of the injustice itself. Doing this means, in the words of James Baldwin, determining the price of the ticket the nation and perhaps our very institutions have paid to sustain the realities of racial injustice and inequality. And no one has paid a greater price than those who have been gravely penalized for not being white. And so we must foreground their knowledge. The point is that it is only when those who have been on the underside of justice began to experience justice that we will know we are actually on the way to the just future of many a mother's dream, and I dare say, the future that God promises. And so it was that the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops put it this way. They said the extent of their suffering, meaning the marginalized, is a measure of how far we are from being a true community of persons that God calls us to become, end quote. As theologian Vincent Lloyd says, those who have the most reason to doubt the wisdom of the world ought to serve as our guides to a more, to, as, a, as our guides to a more just thought and practice. Thus guides, he says, to a more just world. Bottom line is this, we must change our perspective on the world if indeed we want the world to change. This brings me to the last moral assumption when it comes to the preferential option, if you will, of these subjugated voices. When we bring to the center of our knowing, of our own perceptions, the voices and knowledge from those on the underside of this country's history of racial injustice, such as the black enslaved, guess what we discover? We discover that as they fought for their freedom, they actually kept alive the vision of the nation's better angels, of a place where all people could live free. This is the story, indeed, that the 1619 Project tells us as it reframes American history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell about who we are as a country. In so doing, it reveals that how black people have been instrumental in keeping America's democratic vision alive. Nicole Hannah-Jones put it this way, our founding ideals, she says, of liberty and equality were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true. Within this struggle, she says, 
Without the struggle, rather, she says, America would have no democracy at all. The point for us is this. Historically speaking, black people, as well as other oppressed people, typically have not been guided by a white moral gaze. Consequently, they've been able to envision a future in which the sacred humanity of each person is honored and respected. In the final analysis, literally and with intentionality, changing the preferential gaze is an essential part to telling the truth of who we are as a nation and thus moving us perhaps just a bit closer to being the society, the institution, the people that help to fulfill the dreams of many a black mother. In the words of Nobel Prize winning novelist, the late Toni Morrison, there is a future that can be more liberating, she says, than any imagined future if we are willing to identify its evasions, its distortions, its lies, and are willing to unleash its secrets. My friends, last week, black elementary school children in California were sent racist Black History Month cards from their elementary school peers with crown-drawn illustrations and messages such as, and I quote them, to my favorite cotton picker. Another, you're my favorite monkey. As I watch this news story, I must say with tears in my eyes, I thought yet another generation of black mother's dreams are being dashed for their children to grow up in a world where they would not be judged, harassed, and threatened because of the color of their skin, and where their lives would truly, really matter. Georgetown community, this is happening on our watch. We are responsible as people, as institutions of higher learning, to do something about it. We are responsible for doing our part. No part is too small in interrupting a moral imaginary so corrupted by an anti-black white gaze that even elementary school age children think anti-black racism is normal. We must begin with uncompromising intention to do the hard work, to move into the uncomfortable spaces so that the dreams of mothers, of parents, of black children become more, can become more than simply dreams, but that they can become real. To protect the dreams of black children is indeed to protect the very humanity of those not raised black. And so, let on this evening, let us recommit ourselves with vigor and passion to doing the work of interrupting the anti-black white racist narratives that prevent us from expanding our moral imaginary to truly envision a world where each and every one of us sitting in this room and our children and their children will be able to live in a world where indeed they are not judged because of who they are, but they are judged because they are, they are respected because they are sacred. Thank you and let it be so. Quote the words we heard earlier this evening. That's right. That's right. So Reverend Kelly Ron Douglas always asks questions that have to be answered. 
and you've done that tonight for us. So we're here to do that. We're here to talk about the question she raised that we're going to help try and continue to answer. Reverend Ebony Gregorisham is going to help us. Now, this is uh, Reverend G, as she's lovingly called, spends her time with students at Georgetown every single day. That's her mission, her calling, her job. And she's going to moderate this, dis this discussion for us and help us figure out how to change the gaze. How do we change the gaze? Please welcome Reverend G to help do that. The Dean Queen, Queen the Dean. I can hardly gather myself. I wonder if other people need a moment to catch or find their breath and maybe their edges. Um, I wonder, <laughs> you began your talk tonight, um, your lecture, centering yourself as a womanist theologian. I wonder if you could unpack that some for all of us, how being a womanist theologian, a womanist scholar, uh, has you rooted in uh, the kind of place, a foundation that can help you to expand on Dr. King's dreams? Yeah, dreams. Th thank you uh, uh, for this time and thank you for that question. I guess I should, and I'm sure many of you know and perhaps some of you uh, don't when you hear this word womanist, uh, like where in the world uh, did that come from? And of course, it, Alice Walker, the uh, novelist who is uh, best known by many for the color purple, uh, coined that term but in 83, 82. But as she coined that term, it's a term that uh, many uh, young black uh, girl growing up would know because would be accused of being womanish. Right, mm -hmm. and 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 as Alice Walker said, uh, acting grown and knowing mm -hmm. more than you're supposed to know. Uh, uh, and so, Walker coins this term because she's looking for a way, right, to really describe the experiences and the reality and and identify of what it means to be black and female, right? And, and so it's not sort of an additive experience, it's, it's the interaction of mm. moving through the world as, as, as black and female. And so uh, not quite feminist, she says womanist is to feminist as mm -hmm. the color purple is to lavender. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I first encountered this term when I was doing my dissertation uh, uh, so many, many, many years ago. <laughs> Uh, uh, and saw the term and I was searching for a way to describe my experience and my reality. And I knew that there was something missing in sort of black theology, uh, contemporary black theology as it merged with my mentor and uh, Dr. James Cohn, uh, because just as it was missing in the black civil rights movement and black power movements, because they were so male focused, right? Mm -hmm. And there was something missing with, I didn't want to be a feminist because, mm -hmm. right? You know, mm -hmm. it's like uh, the women's movement, mm -hmm. uh, both the suffrage movement and the contemporary women's movement, well, they talked about being rescued from patriarchy, but they didn't talk about mm -hmm. race. And so it was sort of like Sojourner Truth, you all mm -hmm. remember the speech that has been uh, uh, credited to her, Ain't I a Woman? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you know what, if white women get the right to vote, but, but the race restrictions aren't uh, rescinded, then black women still don't get the vote. And if black men mm -hmm. get the right to mm -hmm. vote, but restrictions of gender aren't rescinded, then they, uh, black women still don't get to vote. Goodness gracious, we just get left out. Uh, so that's how I came to womanist. That's what Alice Walker meant by womanist. And for me, what really struck me was that it, in her definition, which I quoted, that it is about the survival and wholeness mm -hmm. of entire mm -hmm. people, 
right? She says, in that time, male mm -hmm. and female. We, mm -hmm. I say, in all of our siblings, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and so, uh, and I like that because it, you know, I I wanted, I didn't have a child then, but you know, I was committed to the entire community, right? It, black men and and et cetera. So other than than, uh, than black women, and so that that felt good. Uh, and and she grounded it in love, right? Uh, and she says, so we, we, we're separatists. Oh, we're not separatists except sometimes for health mm -hmm. and grounded in love. And she also said, which is the other thing that I like, that, you know, uh, that sometimes we, we she de described diverse expressions of sexuality and gender encompassing everybody in that definition. So that struck me. I said, yes. And so that became, for me, the way to, one, affirm. It's like, oh my gosh, someone recognizes this, the experience of being black and female and trying to navigate through these things. That, that term did that without uh, sort of, and, and it did it out of this sense of moving towards survival and wholeness, as she said, out of this sense of love, encompassing everybody. And so that's, that's the path that I try to sort of move in because that's the vision, right? Uh, to, for this wholeness, the survival and wholeness and that freedom is more than just political. She talks about its wholeness so that people can be whole and affirm their whole daggone being. And so that's, that's uh, what I at least, uh, why I identify myself mm -hmm. as a womanist mm -hmm. because that's, that to me is what it stands for. Thank you. That makes me think then, uh, it sounds like that is how, that is your own sort of epistemology in a way, right? How you came to your own knowing. I wonder, and though that's rooted in your own personal experience, how then do others become womanist if they so choose? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's not, you know, you, you, thing about womanist is the reason it took hold is because mm -hmm. it really, resonated. It mm. was a symbol that resonated with a pe person's experience. And so people have to name themselves out of their own experience, mm -hmm. right? And name their own experience. But uh, in as much, the question isn't how they become womanist. The question is, how do they become free? Mm. Right? How do they engage in the work toward freedom, wholeness, right? How do you get there? And when you get there, then where you find yourself is as companions, as in solidarity, if you will, with others who are out there working toward being free. And so you can, you can be out there with womanists, right? Uh, to, you don't have to be a womanist to, a, to engage in that vision that is a womanist vision. And it's about wholeness, it's about freedom. And what I like, why the reason I like wholeness is because it does talk about how do we become free even, how do we become whole and free from those things that hold us back, from living into the best of who we can be. We know we can be better than this, right? Uh, uh, and, and when we aren't, we are betraying our very humanity. And so how can we become free so that we can well, be human. <laughs> uh, uh, and so I think it's not about being womanist. Don't ask yourself, how can I become a woman? It's ask yourself, how can I become free? And when you become free, you're automatically working toward mm. the freedom of others. Thank you. Thank you. You spoke about the arc, right, of the universe bending toward justice. What is your daily practice uh, to follow the bend? It's a long arc, isn't it? <laughs> and, 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 and Martin Luther King Jr., of course, uh, borrowed that phrase or popularized that phrase that came originally from an uh, abolitionist preacher, Theodore Parker. Uh, um, here's my practice, I guess. And because and it, it's a long arc, sometimes hope uh, is hard, but and I'm not perfect in, in, in this, and because none of us are perfect, and I'm certainly not. But here's what I try to live by. 
in sort of my daily walk. And that is not to withhold from another that what I would not want withheld from myself. If I want to be respected, I'm not going to withhold that from another. If I want to feel safe when I walk outside my door and want my child to feel safe, then I'm not going to withhold that from another, which means I'm going to try to work toward making sure. Sick world. I say, and I say that to people, you know, don't withhold from another that which you would not want that which help from yourself. I want enough food to eat. I'm not going to withhold that from another. I want, I want a decent house to live in. I'm not going to withhold that from another. So that what that means for me, not only in the daily walk, but as I make determinations about what policies or uh, laws or things that I am going to support or not support or fight for, I ask that question. Is that withholding from another that which I would not want withheld from myself? I try to go about building the, a community, a, a, a world, and my little part of the garden, which I've been uh, blessed to live in, to not withholding from another that which I would not want withheld from myself. And so that's, that's, that's the internal <laughs> principle that I try to, to live by. Uh, and engage in, and uh, again, not always perfect, right? But uh, that's how I try to stay on the ark. Say, no, no, I wouldn't want someone to withhold that from me, so I'm not going to withhold it from somebody else. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That is a wonderful vision for sure, and in many ways sort of at war with the ways that we are formed to be, uh, not only in a capitalist society, but in a society as you so beautifully expounded upon this um, white gaze and a, sort of a corrupted moral imaginary. Uh, I wonder if you have um, even more practical sort of on the ground uh, advice. I wonder about students who are thinking or feeling in my space and as I walk around the hilltop, how can I shift the gaze around me? Yeah, you know, one of the ways we shift our gaze is we make sure that we are engaging with people who are different from ourselves, right? Uh, uh, and, well, you know, there was uh, the Pew studies as well as the uh, public Religion and Research uh, mm -hmm. Institute, Robbie mm -hmm. Jones' mm -hmm. studies have yeah. shown that 75% uh, of white Americans don't have a single person of color in their intimate social circle. Right. And of the, those who do, that intimate social circle is still over 90% white. Now, what that means is that you don't have anyone that is helping you to open up mm -hmm. your and expand your vision of the world and of yourself, right? Now, on a college campus, this is almost sort of a, uh, it's not a vacuum, but you get this wonderful opportunity, right, for all different kind of people to come together on a college campus. That's not likely the case. Right. We are such a segmented and segregated kind of society, right? And mm -hmm. so you take advantage on a college campus like this of making sure that you are engaging and you have in your circle people who are different from yourselves. And you know, it's, it's not that, oh, that means we're always gonna clash. No, it's just some, when you do that, your world opens up. Hmm and you see things that you didn't see before, right? And so I think with intentionality, if you look around all the time and everyone that's sitting around you and is looking like you, then as a student, you need to say, oh no, something's wrong with this. And you also are not taking advantage of the educational mm. opportunity you have to do that. 
So that's, 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 to me, that's one practical thing that's easy to do, right? Uh, to, uh, and, and, we, and I'm sure on your campus you help people. There are ways in which the campus tries to help to foster that. The other thing that we do, make sure, and you can do it in your class. I'm sure you, this is Georgetown, so I know that Georgetown does it, you know. That, but you make sure that you are reading and taking mm -hmm. courses and engaging in courses in which you are going to be challenged with experiences that are not your own. You just got to. Uh, to, or again, you're wasting. What an opportunity that you're wasting. The other thing is to take advantage, because I know Georgetown has them, of experiences in which you can immerse yourself in other communities, right? Uh, we call them where uh, I, I uh, serve as dean, like immersion experiences, mm -hmm. right? So I think those are really, really easy things to do mm -hmm. uh, to, in your sort of every day life that you just look around and say, okay, love my best friends, really love, love, I don't know, do you all have fraternities and sororities here? Sort of. Sort of? <laughs> but not, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to, but there are some, I'm not gonna call any letters. Oh, okay, don't call, don't call no letters. I like the, I like the sort of not, because uh, sometimes, <laughs> Lord have mercy, but if, if <laughs> I went, to, I went to Denison University. They no longer have them. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was there, they became a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I hear the giggles. I don't know. Uh, 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 and, and so they eventually, well after I left, had to get rid of them. And that's unfortunate because I think they're also positive. So I don't want to put down uh, sororities and fraternities. What I was going to say is get out of your fraternities and sororities. Because usually those are places that gather people who are like one another. And that's why, it, at least at a, play, a campus where I was, and you often hear, just pick up the news, you often hear a lot of problems emerging off of fraternity and sorority roles, right? And that's because you have these groups of people who are just like one another, reinforcing one another, reinforcing each other's limited views and biases and all that, and, and then coming together and then trouble occurs. You got to get, get out of your fraternity and sorority uh, mentalities. Get out of your dualistic, your binary oh. mentalities. That's the sorority and fraternities are binary mentality. Get out of it. Uh, to, uh, and find ways to force yourself out of it. And I really mean that. And that's why a place, and, and uh, I'm uh, from this area, and I know Georgetown and respect it a lot. And that's why a place like Georgetown is important, but students can waste their educational opportunity uh, here and just move through. Uh, don't just move through. Move through open to being changed. Thank you. I feel a way about that fraternity sorority. Um, <laughs> I'm in a sorority. Um, but, I, but I also, what I hear, I, and that, I know, I know, but um, what but I I'm hear not. in that is, <laughs> what I hear in that is uh, to be willing, not per se to leave the organization, but to serve others who are outside to be willing to go the organization, beyond the organization go beyond and, and then which means that you expand your organization right. right of course right and then as a corollary i also hear that as sounding really similar to the church oh actually. yes uh and so i wonder if you could speak about um the ways that we should challenge ourselves and our uh, faith communities to open the doors to to come out no, to be, become what they claim to be, right. faith communities. I mean, many of our faith communities and those things that call themselves church, I say, you know, calling ourselves church, and I'm an Episcopal priest. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I know an Episcopalians, I know that's like, how in the world are you an Episcopal priest? Yeah. Episcopalians are not, uh, as they like to say, complicit in mm -hmm. being uh, slaveholders and stuff. Yes. We, wrote, we, we, we are the <laughs> yeah. church of wealthy slaveholders. Like, we are complicit. Uh, 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 that's generous. So, you know, to call ourselves church, to call yourself church, I always say is aspirational. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, what, just like calling ourselves a democracy, aspirational. Uh, mm. We <laughs> must live into the aspiration. If we call ourselves a faith community, to be a community of faith means that you have committed yourself 
to partnering with God in working toward a more just future. That's what it means. It does mm -hmm. not mean that you committed yourself to doctrine, to dogma, uh, to doctrines. It means that yes. you have committed yourself to partnering with God. It means yes. that you are accountable, not to an institution that calls itself church, but is really a social institution. You are not accountable to a denomination, the doctrine, dogmas, or whatever that denomination are. You are accountable to the just future that God yes. calls us toward. You are accountable yes. to that, whatever you call that transcendent being. That's what you're accountable right. to. For Christians, you're accountable to that thing called the gospel. Uh, to, uh, and so that means sometimes you are at odds with yes. uh, your denomination, whatever that denomination is or whatever that church is. And so to me, it's not about, we talk about, and you have many faith traditions in, in this institution. It's not about saying, come, come be like me. If you're going to be church, it means that you go out there and you do the work that you claim that you were committed to. You do the work. It's not about people coming to you. It's about you doing the work, mm. and then you don't have to worry about people coming to you or if they don't come to you. Just do the work, and that's where you meet the people. And so I agree that churches, denominations, these religious institutions, faith communities, whatever you, how you identify, are not meant to turn in on themselves. They are meant to open up, open themselves up into the world so that they open up the imagination yeah. of the world. And so again, you know, when you have institutions that in any way discriminate against any of God's mm -hmm. children or anybody that is sacred, and those are everybody that has breath or has ever had mm -hmm. breath is a sacred child of God by the virtue of the very breath they breathe. If you have churches that in any way disrespect that sacred breath, then well, they aren't church, and they aren't faith communities, and they aren't who they claim to be. And that means on this campus, out for mm -hmm. this campus, anywhere, includes, includes my own denomination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if uh, there are people in the audience who have questions for the very Reverend Douglas. If you would come to the microphones here, and if you're Georgetown students, please identify yourself, you know, name, rank, serial number in the way that you do. Um, and then ask your question in the form of a question. <laughs> hi, Rev G. Hi. Um, hey, Kesley. Hi. hi. Okay. Um, I'm Kesley. I'm a sophomore in the college. I declared my history major this afternoon, actually. Woo! She declared her right? Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Um, and my question's a little bit pessimistic, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, given <laughs> that like, the United States as a country was founded on like inequality like as an idea, even if it wasn't necessarily anti-Black inequality, like how are we going to like transform a more a uh, moral imaginary that was like kind of doomed from the start? Like it was mm -hmm. never with good intentions and like, from what I understand, like even colonists who were leaving England were, le were the, in theory, fleeing prosecution, but their ideas of prosecution weren't, were still um, exclusionary, even if not on the bounds of race. No, thank you for your question and, and, and a very good uh, question. Yes, <laughs> here's two things that I want to say. You are right in the sense that really in the very foundation of our nation, right? It doesn't take much, you're a historian, so you're gonna, you, you, you know this and you'll see it even more. You don't have to dig deep uh, and far to know that when this nation talked about the city on the hill, if you will, that this notion was that they were carrying forth this vision of these Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, forebears, that they were building this sort of perfect sort of legacy of this Anglo-Saxon heritage is they believe these people carried forth this special virtue uh, to, and this special love for justice and freedom. So I, I'm not going to go through all this. So just to affirm, yeah, you're right. But here's the other thing. And I talk about this often. I talk about it almost as the warring soul of the nation. Just as that was there, and it was deeply rooted, Thomas Jefferson was uh, Anglo-Saxonist par excellence and, and all of uh, those guys. 
those, uh, those founding fathers. But they also, I don't know, maybe by accident, I don't know. But they did give, put forth a vision for a nation where there would be freedom and justice for all. I say that's the sort of rumblings of our soul. There's this vision that, as Lincoln said, calls us to our better angels. And I know Lincoln did not believe in black equality. But somehow, <laughs> they were able to set forth a vision for a true democracy, no matter how limited that vision was for them. It was a vision. That's the vision that we have to, we have to make the decision if we're going to live into that vision, which is the vision of our better quote-unquote angels, or if we are going to live into, well, the worst of who we were and could be. So that, you see, I think, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Kesley. Kesley. That, that's the hope of the nation, right? It's warring soul, deciding who we want to be. And here's the thing that we know. We have always had a history, just as you've had this other history that we know so well, you have always had a history, a movement of a people who have always struggled to live into and make that vision a reality. That's what the 1619 Project tells us. And there are other stories like that, right? Here's what I always say, and it's what gives me hope. Then I'll shut up. And I've written about this. Some of you might have heard me say before, written about it that we come from a people, I come from a people, who were enslaved people. I knew my great-grandmother, who was born into slavery. When I think of her, her name was Mama Mary. When I think of her, I think of those people like her who were born into slavery, died in slavery, never, ever breathed a free breath, never ever imagined that they would breathe a free breath. But guess what they did? They fought for freedom anyhow. They fought for freedom that they knew they would not see, but that they knew would become a reality. They fought for freedom that was the freedom that was the justice of God. And they were able to fight for that freedom because they knew that. And they fought for it because there was a vision of this nation getting a little bit closer to that justice was the justice of God. But for them fighting, those enslaved people doing it, you and me wouldn't be standing here talking. They fought for the children they could not see. That's to me, is the hope of the nation. And the hope of that nation is in that vision that people have refused to just not fight for, right? So. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Michelle. I am from South Africa and I go to the Georgetown campus in Qatar. Yeah. You mentioned that you are a womanist and in fact last semester we're studying a lot of the work of James Coons and many other yes. uh, liberation theologists who write about this. And my question has to do with being a black woman because we sit particularly in the intersection of race and gender and we have both the white gaze and the male gaze looking upon us. And my question is to what extent is the white and male gaze, white and male epistemology, and white and male imaginary shaped by an ontologically white mm. and male Jesus? Oh, yeah, well. <laughs> you have been studying that theology. <laughs> Very good question, because here's what we know. 
Because it is, right? Because here's we know, there's always been a sacred canopy that has legitimated that gaze. Yeah. Right? Always been. There has, you know, in Christianity, as the sort of religion of those in power, has been that provided more times than not that canopy to legitimate that gaze. And one of the ways in which it has done that, there are many ways in which it's done that, but I want to get to your white Jesus. <laughs> your white Jesus. Is it has done that by, well, whitenizing hmm. Christianity. Because hmm. right? here's what we know. Jesus is not white. Well, I'm sorry? Jesus is not white. <laughs> that, but that's what we know. And Jesus is not white, not only theologically, but literally. <laughs> right? You know, we say that's historically incorrect, let alone theologically incorrect. Jesus was a Jew. We might say a Palestinian Jew. That's who he was. So let's just first say who he was, right? So he wasn't white. And so how did he get, how do we get these blonde hair, blue eyed Jesuses? That's just not right. It's not just not correct. Mm -hmm. Secondly, theologically it is incorrect. Because to, well, let me start, let me just say the center thing. In the Christian faith tradition, at the center of Christian faith is a daggone cross. That's a crucifixion. Now, if we're going to be Christian, we need to take that seriously. And that Jesus was crucified means that Jesus entered into utter, uncompromising solidarity with the crucified classes of people of his day, those on the underside those people who in this world would be race black. That's where the, he, he came. His first public speech was, I came to set the oppressed free. And as black preachers like to say in the church, he was born in a manger, not in Herod's palace. So theologically, if we were to say, where were we going to see Jesus today? Well, we're going to see Jesus in the face of, 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 of a George Floyd. We're going to see Jesus in the face of them little kids on the border, uh, being, being uh, shipped around all over uh, the country where there's no room for them in the end. That's where we're going to see Jesus. So theologically and historically and literally, that it, to call Jesus white, to image Jesus as white, is blasphemous and is historically inaccurate. <laughs> and so yes to your question. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Zaina. I'm Hi, Dana. Uh, I'm an econ major, and I'm also on the Qatar campus. Ah. Um, so I'm Palestinian, Good. and I'm really interested in the intersectionality and the solidarity between Amer uh, uh, black people in America and also Palestinians under the occupation, and especially when we look at mothers. So for us under the occupation, mothers are very... Like almost underrated and all very forgotten about because people don't talk about how much of a struggle it is to stay at home mm -hmm. and resist from the home, even if you're not out on the street. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in why you based your speech and narrative around that mother's dream. So why did you choose that? Yeah. Yeah, thank you uh, for your question and for that witness. And you're right. Mm -hmm. And I affirm uh, what you said. Because I'm a mother, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and I do know, and even if I weren't a mother, but that's, I am. But I know that women shoulder the burden. And yet women are expected, even as they shoulder the burden, to carry the load. 
And we know most often, don't we, that it's women of color. I mean, I look at this country. You know, I, I, I like to say, look at the last, you know, couple of elections around here. Black women done uh -huh. saved this democracy again. <laughs> uh, yeah. But because mothers care, and mothers and women, you're right, they're ignored. Their, their resistance, it doesn't have to be a resistance. In the street is ignored. Right? Holding up, trying to, even, even those that are mothers, just try, help. what do you do? I mean, the world you're fighting for is the world for your children and other people's children. And so that's why I, I, I center my story. I'm a mother. And, the, and being a mother gave me an even deeper, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but an, an urgency an even deeper urgency and a deeper understanding of the, the sin that is really, really, I think, betraying not simply the lives of our children, but the humanity of all our, of our children. And I say that the freedom for our children saves your children's humanity. So that's why I don't know any other way to answer it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. I'm Ali Henry, they, them pronouns. I'm a junior in the college studying government and women and gender studies. Great. And first off, thank you. You truly preach like poetry, and it is such mm -hmm. a blessing to be able to hear you speak. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have the privilege of doing reparations work on campus and student organizing around that. And one thing that I've encountered is how reparations work and racial justice work are siloed. There isn't conversation between the two. Bureaucratically, they exist as two separate entities. So in thinking of that fractioning within our institutions and similarly within our own bodies, how does that fractioning further that white imaginary that institutions like Georgetown is founded on? And arguably more importantly, how can we move beyond that white imaginary when everything is so fractioned off? Yeah, what a what a great observation and and a good question and you can't when as you say things are so fractioned off and 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 I like the way you speak of it even cuz that what what that creates and even within ourselves right is this we can't become whole right uh, to, uh in the complexity of of who we are and so you can't and if reparations work is truly reparations work, then it, it cannot be done from the top down. Mm -hmm. It has to occur from the bottom up. You've got to the people who are most impacted in the, in, in, by the legacy in which they carry in their bodies, and in their souls, those people have to be at the table. And those people have, those voices I've taught, have to be heard. They're the people that know. You know, it's sort of like going, you hear these stories all the time. You know, missionaries going and uh, uh, bringing people, I don't know, fish. And they're like, we don't need no fish. That ain't what we need. And when we hear this talk of reparations, the people that are talking about what reparations are going to look like are the people who are carrying the legacy that have gotten us to this daggone place in the first place. Mm -hmm. They are not the people that ought to be telling us what reparations look like. Because what we, what we have discovered that what is happening is that they are, I don't see any real institutional change. I'm not talking about Georgetown, I, but nothing's really changing. Those same people are still in power. Right? So they, why? they're going to tell me what reparations looks like in a way that is going to protect yeah. who they are and protect their status. 
right? You know, give scholarships and all that. Well, why don't we change the reality that have forced us into this position to have to give little trickle-down scholarships? So, so, can't happen. So that's that, yeah. I say that to my church. I say that, so I'm just saying, no, no, no. The, the, why in the world is the enslaver telling me what it means to be free? My God. Mm. And that's what's happening here in these little conversations about reparations. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, Hello. First of all, thank you so much for coming here and speaking to us today. Um, it's an honor to have you here. Oh, and thank you. Um, yeah, um, my name is Priscilla. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service. Um, oh, good. And I have, um, and I care a lot about criminal justice reform. And so um, I, I have two kind of questions. Sure. So first, um, in our nation, in this nation, where um, when there's people who, like, there's an increasing opposition towards things like critical race theory, and sometimes people are um, uncomfortable or unwilling to listen, um, how do you recommend, first of all, engaging with those people and approaching them? And second of all, do you have any recommendations on how to combat disillusionment um, with Mm -hmm. racial inequality, especially when it's so ingrained and syst system systemic. Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. Yes, thank you uh, for your question. Uh, and thank all of you, because your questions, that you all are here. <laughs> I'm Susan, you keep saying, how do we combat, what do we do? You're doing it. Mm. You're pre and I'm serious about your presence here is a witness that you want it to be different and you were engaging and willing to engage, and you don't have to agree with everything I say at all, don't. Uh, but you were, you were engaged, you've put yourself in these spaces, and they may be uncomfortable spaces for some of you, to try to hear and learn and, and ask these questions because you want it to be different. And so first, I, I, I am the one that's honored to be here, and I thank you for being here, and I mean that. So, how, how, how do you, one, you said, engage with those people that, uh, well, don't agree with you, right? Uh, you know, here's what I say. Yeah, we have to find ways to talk across uh, these quote unquote divides. There have to be sort of rules of engagement. And my first rule of engagement, not primary rule, is that you have to respect me hmm. as a sacred human being. If you don't respect me, we can't talk. Which means that you gotta respect others, we, then we can't talk. Hmm. Then perhaps <laughs> we can talk. And I know for some of you, this is not an abstract question because you go home to communities, you go home to dinner tables, perhaps, of you're here and your you're being, your knowledge and your experiences and all of these are being expanded and you go home to places where you're finding yourself in more uncomfortable spaces, even in your own communities. And, and even at your own homes. And how do you do that, right, work? One, respect, but there's got to be, find that place, <laughs> and I mean this, where there is some place of agreement and move from there. And if you can't find that, then maybe it's not the right time for that conversation. Mm -hmm. But try to find that place of agreement. Sometimes for me, I have people in my own family that we disagree on issues about people's humanity. 
And I simply go back to my rule and I ask them, do you want someone to withhold that from you or your child? And they invariably say no. And that's a place to begin the conversation. The other, you asked a question about, what was your second question? Um, yeah, in terms of, I guess, um, like changing the system. Oh. Um, um, when it's, I guess, when progress seems hard or very slow, do you have any um, tips or advice on how to, um, I guess, stay in the fight and keep? Um, no, you know what? The hope is in the protest. And the hope is in the, res the resistance. And you don't know. You don't, you can't always see, as I said earlier in there, you can't always see what the consequence will be. Yeah. Right now I'm teaching a course uh, at Union Theological Seminary with another professor, Dr. Sarah Azaransky, and we're teaching a course on Bayard Rustin and Pauli Murray. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, both Pauli Murray was the first black female priest. Pauli Murray uh, was a priest, activist, lawyer. Pauli Murray was soul world. Uh, that others uh, couldn't see. And Pauli Murray always said that I, I, I want a world really where a Pauli Murray can exist. Pauli Murray was uh, African-American but of mixed heritage. Pauli Murray was also uh, 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 gender nonconforming and didn't have, then didn't have the language and all of that for it. And then there was Bayard Rustin, right, who's... Uh, without Bayard Rustin, there'd be no March on Washington, there'd be no many things. But here's what both of them said, and, 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 and that is that you don't know what the sort of consequences and when you'll see the consequences of your struggles toward justice, right? But you do know and you do see what the consequences are of injustice. Those you do know. And so you just continue on the road toward, as, as Bayard Rustin would say as a Quaker, of going toward the truth. And you don't know, but you do know what it looks like when you don't. And that's, that's all you can do, and, and you know in your space, <laughs> right? that you are working toward that better place and making it better in your little corner of the garden. And I always say, and I'm gonna end, end here with this, don't anyone think I'm always hopeful. <laughs> I've written about that. That was what my last book was about, this deep moment of despair. Just where you are, it's like, oh my gosh, just this, this is futile. You know, I'm, I'm, I understood deeply the Afro-pessimists. The only thing that brought me out of my despair was I went down, I was during quarantine here because uh, they sort of bilocate between here and New York. I went down to Black Lives Matter Plaza. And I'm a germaphobe, and so for me to go down there in the middle of the quarantine, put on my mask, and I went down to the plaza because I was feeling that despair and the edge of hopelessness where W.E.B. Du Bois said, keep silent, keep not thou silent, O God. I heard those words and it's like, oh my God, keep not thou silent, O God. And when I went down there, I saw these people young and old, uh, the, all colors, all ages, as I said, all uh, gender uh, identifications and sexual, I saw, I saw the diversity that is God's creation, all in the middle of a pandemic, risking their lives to protest that black lives matter. I saw the vision in that protest. It was going down there that gave me hope. So when you despair, 
Make sure you get engaged somewhere in, in, in the struggle for justice, and you'll find your hope. Thank you. Thank Priscilla. you so much. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, will you join me in thanking the very Reverend Kelly Brown Douglas for her time, for her wisdom, and for her witness? Thank you. Thank you.